past week, a mob of unwinds have discovered that the Goldens have been murdered. Um, they, of course, think it's the Admiral, but we know it's someone else. We just don't know who. Uh, MB's gone missing. Uh, Reese has gone to visit the um, Admiral who's having a heart attack. When the mob attacks the airplane and she locks them in the airplane to keep them safe. Connor has Roland locked in a crate and, um, you know, that's where we're at. Chapter 45, Mob. The fortress of the Admiral's jet is impenetrable. The temperature inside is soaring past 100. Reese is handling the heat, but the Admiral doesn't look so good. She still can't open the door because the mob is relentlessly trying to get in. Outside, whatever kids aren't swarming over the Admiral's jet are spreading out. If they can't get to the Admiral, then they'll destroy everything else. The study jets, the dormitory jets, even the recreation jet, everything is being torn apart, and whatever can burn is set aflame. They're filled with an insatiable fury, and beneath it is a strange joy that the anger can finally be released, and beneath the joy is more fury. From halfway across the graveyard, Cleaver sees the smoke rising in the distance, beckoning him. Cleaver is drawn to mayhem. He must be a witness to it. He gets into his helicopter and flies toward the angry mob. He sets down as close to the chaos as he dares to get. Have his deeds in any way led to this? He hopes so. He turns off the engine, letting the blade slow so he can hear the wonderful sounds of havoc. Then the angry unwinds turn toward him. It's Cleaver! He works for the Admiral! Suddenly, Cleaver is the center of attention. He can't help but feel this is a good thing. Chapter 46, Connor. If it will scroll up. <laughs> Neat. <laughs> Just gonna sit here. There we go. Roland is slowly breaking. He confesses to many things. Petty acts of vandalism and theft that Connor couldn't care less about. But this has to work. It's going to work. It has to work. Connor has no other plans to bring him to justice. It has to work. I've done a lot of things, Roland tells him through the three bullet holes in the crate, but I never killed anybody. Connor just listens. He barely speaks to him anymore. Connor finds the less he speaks, the more Roland does. How do you even know they're dead? Because I buried them, me and the Admiral. Then you did it, says Roland. You did it. You're trying to make me take the blame. Now Connor sees the flaw in his plan. If he lets Roland out without a confession, then he's a dead man. But he can't keep him in here forever. His options are now narrower than the space between the crates. Then a voice calls to them from outside. Is anyone there? Connor? Roland? Anybody? It's Hayden. Help! Screams Roland at the top of his lungs. Help! He's crazy! Come in here and let me out! But his screams don't make it out of the hold. Connor gets up and makes his way to the entrance. Hayden looks up at him. He's not his usual cool self, and there's a nasty bruise on his forehead, like he was hit by something. Thank God. Connor, you gotta get back there. It's nuts. You gotta stop it. They'll listen to you. What are you talking about? The Admiral killed the Goldens, and then everyone thought he killed you. The Admiral didn't kill anybody. Well, try telling them that. Them who? Everybody. They're tearing the place apart. Connor can see the far-off smoke, and he takes a quick glance behind into the hold, deciding that for the moment, Roland can wait. He hops down to the ground and races off with Hayden. Tell me everything from the beginning. When Connor arrives at the scene, his mind keeps trying to reject what his eyes are telling him. He stares, part of him hoping the vision will go away. It's like the aftermath of some natural disaster. Broken bits of metal, glass, and wood are everywhere. Pages torn from books flutter past smashed, smashed electronics. Bonfires burn, and the kids hurl in more wreckage to feed the flames. My god. There's a group of jeering kids near the helicopter, gathered like a grugby scrum, kicking something in the center. Then Connor realizes it's not something, it's someone. He races in, pulling the kids apart. The kids who know Connor immediately back off, and the others follow suit. The man on the ground is battered and bloody. It's Cleaver. Connor kneels down and props up his head. It's okay. You're going to be okay. But even as he says it, Connor knows it's not true. He's beaten to a pulp. Connor grimaces, his mouth bloody. Then Connor realizes that this isn't a grimace at all. It's a smile. Chaos, man, Cleaver says weakly. Chaos. 
It's beautiful. Beautiful. Connor doesn't know what to say to this. This man's delirious. He has to be. It's okay, Cleaver says. This is an okay way to die. Better than suffocating, right? Connor can only stare at him. What? What did you say? No one but Connor and the Admiral know about the suffocations. Connor, the Admiral, and the one who did it. You, you killed the Goldens? You and Roland? Roland? Says Cleaver. In spite of his pain, he actually seems insulted. Roland's not one of us. He doesn't even know. Cleaver catches a look on Connor's face and begins to laugh. Then the laugh becomes a rattle that resolves into a long, slow exhale. The grin never entirely leaves his face. His eyes stay open, but there's nothing in them, just like his victim, Amp. Oh, crap. He's dead, isn't he? Says Hayden. They killed him. Holy crap, they killed him. Connor leaves the dead pilot in the dust and storms toward the Admiral's plane. He passes the infirmary along the way. Everything's been torn out of there as well. Risa, where's Risa? There are still kids all over the Admiral's jet. The tires have been slashed. Wing flaps lean at jagged angles like broken feathers. The entire jet lists to one side. Stop it! screams Connor. Stop it now! What are you doing? What have you done? He reaches up to the wing, grabs a kid's ankle, and pulls him onto the ground, but he can't do that for every single one of them. So... He grabs a metal pole and smashes it against the wing over and over, the sound ringing out like a church bell until he ha their attention turns his way. Look at you! He screams. Sorry about that. You destroyed everything! How could you have done this? You should all be unwound! Every single one of you! You should all be unwound! It stops everyone. The kids on the wings, the kids at the bonfires, the shock of hearing such words from one of their own snaps them back to sanity. The shock of hearing his own words and knowing that he meant them frightens Connor almost as much as the scene before him. The rolling staircase leading to the Admiral's jet has fallen on its side. Over here, says Connor. Help me with this. A dozen kids, their fury spent, come running obediently. Together they right the stairs, and Connor climbs up to the hatch. He peers in the window. Connor can't see much. The Admiral's there on the floor, but he's not moving. If the Admiral can't get up to the door, they'll never be able to get in. Wait, is that someone else in there with him? Suddenly a lever is thrown on the inset, and the hatch begins to swing open. The heat hits him instantly, a blast furnace of heat. And the face of the door is so red and puffy, it takes him a moment to realize who it is. Risa? She coughs and almost collapses into his arms, but manages to keep herself up. I'm okay, she says. I'm okay, but the Admiral... Together they go in and kneel beside him. He's breathing, but it's shallow and strained. It's the heat, says Connor, and orders the kids lingering at the door to open every hatch. It's not just the heat, says Risa. Look at his lips. They're chionic. This pressure is down to nothing. Connor just stares at her, not comprehending. Sorry, phone call coming in. I apologize. We will come back to it later. <clears throat> He's having a heart attack. I've been giving him CPR, but I'm not a doctor. There's only so much I can do. Uh, my, my fault, says the Admiral. My fault. Shh, says Connor. You're going to be okay. But Connor knows, just as he knew when he said it to Cleaver, the diff chances of that are slim. They carry the Admiral down the stairs, and as they do, the kids waiting outside back away, making room for him as if it's already a coffin you're carrying. They set him down in the shade of the wing. Then kids around them begin to murmur. He killed the Goldens, someone says. The old man deserves what he gets. Connor boils, but he's gotten much better at keeping his anger in check. Cleaver did it, Connor says forcefully enough for everyone to hear. Then it starts a murmur through the crowd until someone says, Yeah, well, what about Embi? The Admiral's hand flutters up. My, my son. Embi's his son? Says one kid, and the rumor begins to spread through the crowd. Whatever the Admiral meant, it's now lost in incoherence as he slips in and out of consciousness. If we don't get into a hospital, he'll die, says Risa, giving him chest compressions once more. Connor looks around, but the closest thing to the car on the graveyard is a golf cart. There's the helicopter, 
says Hayden, but considering the fact that the pilot's dead, I think we're screwed. Risa looks at Connor. He doesn't need to read Risa for morons to know what she's thinking. The pilot is dead, but Cleaver was training another one. I know what to do, says Connor. I'll take care of it. Connor stands up and looks around him, the smoke-stained faces and the smoldering bonfires. After today, nothing will be the same. Hayden, he says, you're in charge. Get everything under control. You're kidding me, right? Connor leaves Hayden to grapple with authority and finds three of the largest kids in his field of vision. You, you, and you, says Connor says, I need you to come with me to the FedEx jet. The three kids step forward, and Connor leads the way to crate 2399 two, and Roland. This, Connor knows, is not going to be an easy conversation. Chapter 47, First Year Residents. In her first six months of working in the emergency room, the young doctor has seen enough strange things to fill her own medical school textbook, but this is the first time someone has crash-landed a helicopter into the hospital parking lot. She races out with a team of nurses, orderlies, and other doctors. It's a small private craft, a four-seater maybe. It's in one piece and its blades are still spinning. It missed hitting the parked car by a half yard. Someone's losing their flying license. Two kids get out, carrying an older man in bad shape. There's already a gurney rolling out to meet them. We have a rooftop helipad, you know. He didn't think he'd be able to land on it, says the girl. When the doctor looks at the pilot, still sitting behind the controls, she realizes that losing his license is not an issue. The kid at the controls can't be any older than 17. She hurries to the old man. A stethoscope brings barely a sound from his chest cavity. Turning to the medical staff around her, she says, Stabilize him and prep him for transplant. Then she turns back to the kids. You're lucky you landed at a hospital with a heart bank or we'd have to end up medevac him across town. Then the man's hand rises from the gurney. He grabs her sleeve, tugging with more strength than a man in his condition should have. No transplant, he says. No, don't do this to me, thinks the doctor. The orderlies hesitate. Sir, it's a routine operation. He doesn't want a transplant, says the boy. You brought him in from God knows where with an underage pilot to save his life and you won't let us do it? We have an entire tissue locker full of healthy young set hearts. No, transplant, says the man. It's uh, against his religion, says the girl. Tell you what, says the boy. Why don't you do whatever they did before you had a tissue locker full of healthy young hearts? The doctor sighs. At least she's still close enough to medical school to remember what that is. It drastically lowers his chance of survival. You know that, don't you? He knows. She gives the man a moment to ch more to change his mind, then gives up. The orderlies and other staff rush the man back toward the ER, and the two kids follow. Once they're gone, she takes a moment to catch her breath. Someone grabs her arm, and she turns to see the young pilot, who has been silent through all this. The look on his face is pleading, yet determined. She thinks she knows what it's about. She glances at the helicopter, then at the kid. Take it up with the FAA, she says. If he lives, I'm sure you'll be off the hook. They might even call you a hero. I need you to call the juvie cops, he says, his grip getting a little stronger. Excuse me? Those two are runaway unwinds. Just as soon as the old man is admitted, they'll try to sneak away. Don't let them. Call the juvie cops now. She pulls out of his grip. All right, fine. I'll see what I can do. And when they come he says. Make sure they talk to me first. She turns from him and heads back into the hospital, pulling out her cell phone on the way. If he wants the juvie cops, fine, he'll get them. The sooner they come, the sooner this whole thing can fall into the category of not my problem. Okay, you have another prediction discussion question today. Make sure that you use evidence from the chapter to prove what you think is about to happen. And then uh, comprehension questions for your assignment. They are multiple choice, so you guys have got this under control. You rock. I believe in you. Okay, bye.